And so um, we live and work in community, um, collectively, and this is how we're pulling off not being <coughs> grant dependent. And none of us, like we're all volunteers, so when people are full time, they have their food and housing covered by the donations that we pull together from all these places around. And so people jump in and out in all different forms of volunteering to get this work done. And so, yeah, what else is there to say about that? Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because we're about to segue into talking about a whole bunch of other things. It, just, it seems like you have forged this wonderful alliance. Like if you think about, you know, if, if you, but to go into a small town, you would expect the kind of reception that you get. I mean, just in, in light of what they might perceive as your political bent. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 this type of thing, like you say, the, the critical words, I thought when you say, we not rely on grant funding, not even government funding. And so you're kind of like, you're, you're instead of being this polarizing force, you're, you're actually this, I, I, I'm fascinated by this sort of thing. And you can get the right and the left. I mean, to say it really bluntly, but I mean, you know, that I just, I'm amazed at that, that you're able to pull that off. I think that many of us could profit from looking at that kind of model when you're able to build a you know. Well, well I, I feel like there's a few um, sort of things that we really did right or whatever that's worth mentioning about how we moved ourselves into this community was um, one thing is we didn't shoot our own horn. They're very um, shy for a long time. We didn't come in and say, here, here's what we do, and we're here to save you, and blah, blah, blah. We just like don't take ourselves that seriously. We were trying to f figure out if we could fix this building up, and so people really appreciated how humble that approach was, and it wasn't until we actually finished the building that we really started coming out to the community, and so um, we really won a lot of people over in that way. Also, it's notable that um, certainly not everyone in this part of the world, but the vast majority of people in, in this area are, are white. And so it it's cuts this whole section of like tension out of the situation where we were really operating around thinking about class and trying to, to be on the, you know, make allegiances and operate in a way that people in the working class people of this area would be excited about what we're doing and that this wasn't a project that was for people from away and like the summer people because there's a there's a huge class division in our community and so really I think one of the the, the biggest achievements of of, of um, restoring this space is that usually when a building gets macked out to the nines as we have done here it as a cultural center it then gets taken away from the community and it becomes this like twenty dollars a seat for some theater tickets or whatever kind of thing and that we have totally not done that the building is paid off and we get to have all of the <coughs> events for free and so everything's all ages drug and alcohol free and and free and so for us to be able to have the space yeah. that's so fucking gorgeous for the people whose building it is feels like a huge deal. And people are still kind of like, whoa, really? <laughs> like we don't have to pay for it? That's fucking awesome, yeah. right? So the other thing is that we didn't, at trying to create a social center, we didn't pick a random, a random rental sort of situation. Um, we picked a building that already had this beautiful history Right, so this building is like on this sketchy corner and you have to drive around really slow and for years people were watching it fall apart and it, so it kind of became this like wishing well where people would drive <coughs> the thing and be like, oh man, why does stuff like that have to fall apart, you know? Like people would leave their heart on this building of like, God, I wish that would come back to life. So we got the treat of being the angels that drop out of nowhere to like restore this thing that already had this rich history, <coughs> right? So it's not like some random space that we're doing good, like trying to be do-gooders in and then trying to convince people to come over, even though it's like intimidating and people see it as like our space. This is very much a piece of the community that's come back to life. And so in that way, we're seen as kind of stewards of the space and not as owners of the space. And so that was like a, a really um, pivotal decision that we made. So I could go on and on, but <laughs> so, um, We'll just move on to other stuff <laughs> about what we're doing before we jump into talking about the poll poster. All right. <laughs> so, a little known thing 
about the beehive is that we actually started as a stone mosaic mural cooperative. Um, we took on these big mural projects and then ended up needing apprentices and wanted to teach people. And so in the beginning, eight women showed up who had all met each other at a, a big protest in DC about the IMF. And we started finishing this big mural project together and working on other mosaics and taking on apprentices. And so this is the traditional kind of stone mosaic that's a, a really um, like a lost art that it's all marble and granite that's very tediously cut bit by bit by hand and um, laid out to describe really richly the fur and feathers and things on the creature. <coughs> and we never thought we would find any more anything more labor intensive and neurotic to do than mosaic until the posters came along. Um, and this was very, the, the formation of the collective was very <coughs> much um, activists who were trying to figure out some way to feed their fidgety, some kind of art therapy for us to do that we could work our shit out and be able to be useful to the big world. So we weren't really coming at it as <coughs> artists who were adding activism in as our subject matter, but rather activists <coughs> who were trying to figure out how to use visual things to talk wow. about our concerns, right? So, and, and find other visual learners and engage people on that level of stuff. So it may seem really random and like all over the place, what I'm talking about here of like mosaics and this town and graphics and there's a lot of things going on, but there's really a theme that goes through everything that we do. And all us bees are geeked out about being able to think about and hold in our minds the macrocosm and the microcosm simultaneously and think about the play between those things. So like the big picture and the little picture and being able to exercise both parts of our minds in that way. Because a lot of us <laughs> in the group um, grew up in this culture on video games and junk food and television and we have the attention span of a flea. So for us, this is like exercising that our attention span and trying to figure out ways to, to not just um, work on ourselves individually, but be useful to the larger picture, right? So mosaic, by the way, this is somebody's first mosaic. This is like an apprentice work and it's all scrap from behind countertop places. And um, so the mosaic obviously is an is a example of like all the little pieces and moving around to make the big picture. And then biodiversity obviously is like all the little details, right, that like add up to the larger ecosystem. We totally geek on thinking how all that stuff's connected and um, intermingled. And then in the beginning, the original intention with the posters was to try to make these visual maps where people could, we could like lay out where all the single issues, how they interconnect, because our group very much formed alongside the upsurge of the anti-globalization movement post um, protests in Seattle around the WTO 10 years ago. Um, we really wanted to be useful to helping people think about this super overwhelming stuff about globalization, environmental destruction, climate change, all of these things as in a way where you could see yourself in the little picture and then draw it, draw it out from there as a map of where you fit. So alongside um, figuring out how to pull this stuff off and form ourselves as a group and um, get our needs met, our basic needs met, we've also been figuring out how to evolve this methodology um, that's brought it up out of making these posters. And so um, we've been figuring out um, how to achieve our goals of making uh, art that's respectful of its audience, that's cross-cultural, that is um, a tool that can be used across borders for people to describe what's going on. And so um, in that way, we've been pushing ourselves with each project to try to make the, um, the genesis of all the ideas come as directly from the source that it, as possible. So to do that, <coughs> we've been talking to all sorts of people and trying to get the story straight. So this is a, a picture of us um, talking at a young teacher's training school in Honduras and um, collecting a lot of stories from kids there that we would use as context for the poster. <laughs> and then um, when we started working on the poster about coal that we're gonna get into tonight, um, we again wanted to go to the people who were most affected 
um, by the issues and get their story first and be accountable to those people. So we were taking our graphics around uh, Appalachia, talking to all sorts of people, trying to gather those stories. 